Um, I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I'm grateful to your premier, Jay Weatherall, for inviting me to Adelaide for the month, and to Gabe Kelly and Ann Rhodes for organizing this unique in the world thinker in residence program, and to uh, uh, Simon Murray and Matthew White uh, at St. Peter's College Adelaide for housing us and for such good hospitality. Um, I'm aware that uh, more than half of you have heard me speak, so I've decided to give a completely new lecture that none of you have ever heard before. Uh, and uh, so it will be unpolished and it will be, uh, have lots of uh, uncongenial ends to it. But since uh, today's symposium is titled The Science of Well-Being, uh, and I am an active scientist, I thought, rather than tell you about the present and the past, I was going to tell you what's on my mind and what I think is hot in the future of positive psychology. And I, I think I'll probably talk for about 50 minutes, and then I hope we'll have about a half an hour of questions. So um, that's, that's what I'm on, on for today. Let me uh, outline what I think I'm going to do. And because I haven't done it before, I don't know what will really happen. Um, uh, well, the framework, the PERMA framework, and I guess I'll just say that now since many of you know it, uh, I've essentially argued that, that well-being as a notion has five pillars. And the acronym that I use is PERMA. The first pillar is the smiley face, uh, the hedonic view, feeling good, uh, happiness. Uh, the second pillar is engagement, being totally wrapped up in what you're doing, being one with the music. The third pillar is good relationships. The fourth pillar is meaning and purpose. And the fifth pillar is accomplishment. Uh, and what I want to do is uh, go through uh, the history of psychology as I see it and the basic premises that uh, I grew up with that psychology as usual had. And then I want to say the way in which positive psychology turns many of the basic premises of psychology as usual on its head. The most important premise that gets turned on its head from my point of view will be a new one and I think a shocking one in many ways. So you've all grown up and I did too believing that we were driven by the past and indeed psychology is about habits and how to try to change those. And I'm going to argue that human beings are drawn into the future. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, neuroscience and cognition of, of a species that uh, is constantly doing if X then Y, scanning through all those possibilities and making decisions among possible futures. I think we're a unique species in that way. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, scientific developments that uh, I think are at the cutting edge of positive psychology. Uh, and the ones I chose were first to talk about money and wealth. And I'm particularly doing that because uh, you, you live in a, a very wealthy society, one of the most wealthiest societies in the world. And uh, once a society is extremely wealthy and you qualify, even though there are many people left out of it, the question is what is, what is wealth for? So I'm going to talk about what's known about the relationship between wealth and well-being. And it is not straightforward. Uh, then uh, I work on creativity and genius. And I know genius is an old and unfashionable world but a word, but I think it's real. And I think as we think about the future of, of uh, uh, humanity, the question of, of innovation and creativity looms large. And so I'm going to try to tell you some stuff that you probably don't know that's being uncovered about creativity. Uh, <coughs> I, I spend a lot of my time uh, working on uh, physical health. And I'm interested in the question of uh, predicting across time uh, cardiovascular disease, mortality, and the like. And uh, quantifying, in fact, the, the health assets. So the usual epidemiology of health looks at risk factors like uh, blood pressure and cholesterol. And there are huge industries that have sprouted up about it. So I'm part of a, a large group of people uh, sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says, let's hold the risk factors constant 
And let's look at health assets like optimism, having a good marriage, uh, high heart rate variability. Do these protect you against uh, mortality, morbidity, uh, and the like? And uh, I'll tell you at some length about that. Um, then I want to talk about measurement. So to the extent uh, we're interested in well-being. If, if I was up here 30 years ago talking about well-being, uh, I think it, I couldn't have said much because well-being wasn't well measured 30 years ago. And indeed, part of the reason GDP is the way we evaluate government uh, and public policy is that the dollar is measurable. Well, in the last 30 years, the measurement of well-being uh, is... Uh, I, I won't say it's as uh, reliable, but it's up there with the dollar. And I'm going to suggest to you that the measurement of PERMA, how much positive emotion people have, how engaged they are at work, how good are their relationships, how much meaning they have in life, is just as measurable as the A, accomplishment. And I'm going to tell you what's going on in measurement. And it's uh, the fact that measurement has become respectable that allows us to ask the question, can we evaluate how a corporation or a government is doing, not just by GDP or unemployment or dollars, but also by changes in well-being? And as you may know, the Prime Minister of England, David Cameron, has decided to do exactly that. So measuring the well-being of the UK and holding himself accountable for changes in public policy by changes in well-being, revolutionary changing government. So I'll talk about measurement. Uh, and then, I, depending on time, uh, there's a very important new book on the medications for mental illness. This is not my work at all, but it keeps me up at four in the morning. It's very worrisome. It's Robert Whitaker's book, The Anatomy of Illness, The Anatomy of an Epidemic. How many of you have read that book or know what it's about? Okay, then it's worth my saying something about it. It's a shocker, and it's a uh, uh, very worrisome about uh, the future of our young people. And finally, uh, since a lot of my work, uh, the guts of it, is does positive psychology work? That is, if you do positive interventions with individuals in schools in the entire United States Army on the web, the question is, what is the outcome? Does it work, or is it just like dieting, in which uh, you can lose weight for a... Uh, uh, short period of time, but within a couple of years, you're back where you were. And the answer is that the outcomes are really very promising. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do in our next hour if uh, uh, it comes about in that way. So let me start with what I think has been a rock bottom premise of medicine and psychology. And it's the notion of what is the most we can ever hope for in life. Uh, what is the best we can do? What, what should we be striving for? And uh, the wisdom from the mountain that came from Freud and before Freud, Schopenhauer, is that the best you can ever do in life is not to be miserable. That is to hold your suffering as close to zero as possible. And that indeed is the illness view uh, of uh, psychiatry, psychology, social work, and the like. Now, I'm making a different claim, and that is I think that view is one empirically false, uh, morally insidious, and I think it's a political dead end. I think we've actually arrived at the political dead end. So when you lie in bed at night, for the most part, unless you're suffering mental illness pretty much, you're mostly thinking of how to go from plus two to plus five in life. You're not thinking about how to go from minus eight to minus six in life. Minus eight to minus six is what psychology and medicine have done for 150 years. And so I'm going to say that any endeavor that is remedial in nature, the treatment of illness, for example, uh, psychology as usual, even if you're asymptotically successful, the best you can ever get to is zero. And what is possible, I'm going to claim, in human life, measurable and buildable, is stuff above zero. And that's what today is about. Uh, by the way, I'm not saying we should replace uh, the medical model or the treatment of mental illness with positive psychology. I'm saying this is another arrow in our quiver. It's a, in addition 
to the tools for going from minus 8 to minus 3. There are tools for going from plus 1 to plus 9 in life. Um, and uh, Schopenhauer and Freud come from a, a, a distinguished intellectual background, and it's what every educated person absorbed in their uh, schooling. Uh, the, the great 19th century intellectuals, uh, Darwin, Marx, and Freud, all of whom had something in common, all of whom argued that we were prisoners of the past. Uh, Darwin, we're prisoners of our gene, what we now call a genome. Uh, Marx, that were prisoner of uh, class and wage and historical studies uh, uh, stuff. And Freud, that were prisoners of the sexual and uh, uh, aggressive uh, traumas uh, and conflicts that are unresolved from our youth. Uh, I'm going to claim that that's a very inadequate formulation of human beings. Uh, that, but they have in common, we're driven by the past. And once you believe that human beings are creatures of the past, then uh, there are a whole bunch of premises that immediately get entrenched. And they're the premises that got entrenched in psychology as usual. So the first is, ah, well, what we really need to investigate, what, what influences from the past is the bad stuff, uh, negative events and negative emotion. Uh, and uh, what we should really be interested in then, since we're interested in negative events and negative emotions, is disorder and illness, the depression and the like. And those become our target categories. And naturally, uh, if we want to know about Australia, a uh, history of a society, what we really need to know is fatal shore, the convict history. I think, by the way, that tells us almost nothing about Australia. Uh, that it, uh, and so I'm going to say that quite radically, that, that Australia of today is uh, discon discontinuously different from its convict history. It is the history of great women and men who made decisions uh, to create a nation. Uh, but we should be interested in history and obsessed. But by the way, I'm going to say a lot of things that are intended to offend and be uncongenial today. <laughs> and that, that's one of them. Uh, and uh, if we're interested in individuals as opposed to societies, we should be terrifically interested in childhood. Well, I think childhood is overrated. Uh, and, and what this amounts to, uh, childhood is important, but it is not the be-all and end-all of developmental psychology or even of human development. Uh, and this is, uh, in its uh, most extreme form, is uh, Laplacian determinism, which says that if, uh, if you know the position and momentum of every particle in the universe at a given time, you can predict the entire future and you can post it the entire past. And many of you probably believe that. That, that is, uh, uh, characterizes no science I've ever heard of. Every science I know is statistical in nature, and the best we ever predict is a distribution of possible outcomes. Once you take seriously the notion that science is statistical, uh, hard determinism has a very hard time. Uh, and the goal that follows from these premises is what we're after is, is the remediation of disabling conditions. Now, again, I'm all for that, but I want to say that's only half of what we should be doing. I'm a I've been a therapist most of my life, and, and uh, I uh, uh, was taught that if I managed to do good work and I got rid of all of her, helped her get rid of all of her anger and all of her sadness and all of her anxiety, that I would get a happy person. And once in a while, uh, all of those things happened, but I never got a happy person. I got an empty person. And that's because the skills of having positive emotion, good relations, engagement, meaning in life are completely different from the skills of not being sad or not being angry or not being anxious. So uh, I'm going to change the goal in this. So here are the new premises that follow from Positive, a positive psychological view that say it, it is, it's, we can do better than zero. The first is that we should be interested in positive events and positive emotion. We should be interested in well-being. And uh, very importantly, uh, as you're listening now, what you're doing cognitively is taking what I'm saying and asking 
how and if and whether you can apply this to your patients, uh, to your husband, to your children. What you're doing is formally conditionals. If X, then Y. And uh, that is going, the, a, a huge amount of, of human phenomenology is if X, then Y. And uh, uh, psychology couldn't cope with the notion that the future intruded on the present. It violates natural law. There's no way the future can intrude on the present. But if you think we've got the cognitive machinery to imagine different futures and to choose among them, there's nothing mysterious or metaphysical about that. That is indeed uh, a major function of uh, your frontal lobes. And it was actually discovered in a, a most bizarre way uh, that it's a, the real circuitry for this that's on a lot of the time. So there are hundreds of studies in which we put people in fMRI machines and we give them mental arithmetic or whatever because we want to know what brain circuits light up uh, when you do mental arithmetic or analogies or whatever. Uh, but you have to have a control group. Okay, so in all of these hundreds of studies, there's a group that's told just lie there and don't do anything. Well, it turns out the just lie there and don't do anything group is much more consistent than the mental arithmetic. There is a circuit that lights up. It's uh, the same circuit that lights up if I ask you to um, uh, think about what you might do tomorrow or to... Uh, 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 think about what John Hendry might be thinking as I'm giving this lecture. It's the daydreaming circuit. It's the circuit that imagines the future. And that's, it's called the default circuit now, and that's what we're doing. So I'm uh, very interested in the cognition and neuroscience of being drawn into the future. And I think this is a new premise, that human beings are creatures of imagination. And if we can measure and build imagination, formally uh, the richness of if, if X, then Y, then this may uh, uh, help us along in our educational task. And uh, once you take this point of view, you can get, if, if all you think about is bad events and you're interested in depression, it is plausible to view depression as a wall that falls on you. Uh, you don't need notions of will and choice. Uh, the human being can be passive. But once you start thinking about positive emotion, engagement, good relationships, and meaning, these are chosen by and large. They're skills that are learned and they're chosen. So notions of will and choice, which psychology as usual could dispense with, are rock bottom in positive psychology. Uh, and the goal then changes. Uh, again, we're not abandoning the goal of getting rid of disabling conditions, but the goal changes to what are the enabling conditions of life. And as I said about patients, merely removing the pathology doesn't produce happiness. You have to plant the skills of positive emotion, engagement, good relationships in life. So the supplementary goal is to build uh, enabling conditions, and that is my notion of flourishing. Uh, so flourishing for me is uh, the presence of positive emotion, engagement, relationships, uh, meaning, and positive achievement. And importantly, and this is what my other public lectures have been about and I'm not going to do today, each of those five elements is measurable. Uh, if you're interested in measuring them, uh, one of my tasks has been to put these up for free for everybody. So at my website, authentichappiness.org, uh, uh, the 20 leading tests of PERMA are available for you and your kids. You're welcome to take them. Uh, uh, two and a half million people have registered at that website and taken the tests that are very good norms. And interestingly, each of the PERMA skills is teachable. That is, you can actually have more positive emotion in your life than you do now. You can have more engagement in your work and with the people you love than you do now. You can have better relations than you do now. You can have more meaning in life and uh, uh, you can accomplish more. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. That's what I've been talking about in my uh, other public lectures, but they may come up in question period. So what I want to do today is really highly impressionistic and subjective and it's very much from where I sit 
there are uh, dozens of uh, very fine positive psychologists around the world who probably have a different view of what the hottest developments are. So this is strictly my impressions. And I'm not going to be showing graphs and figures. I'm going to try to talk my way through the science that's going on here. So the first thing I want to talk about is m money. And what um, pretty much all of us believed 25 years ago was that the more money you have, the happier you were. Well, once people started to look at this carefully, uh, it was clear that that was false. And what emerged robustly, and I'd say close to a thousand studies, is a curvilinear relationship between how satisfied you are with life and money. A curvilinear looks, looks like this, that it's linear up to the end of poverty. So if you're below the safety net, then for every extra dollar you earn up to the safety net, uh, life satisfaction increases. But then something very different happens. You start to get very diminishing returns so that uh, in the United States, and probably Australia is similar, although I haven't seen an Australian uh, graph, at about above $70,000 a year, uh, further increments in money uh, produce almost nothing as far as increased mood goes. And above 120,000, you can, you can divide, if I ask you, Gabe, how satisfied are you with your life on a one to 10 scale, and Gabe says seven, uh, that actually turns out to consist of two different components. One is what mood you happen to be in. If you happen to be in a good mood, tends to be higher. If your bad mood happens to be low. And secondly, the judgment of the conditions of your life. And uh, depending on the study you're looking at, uh, it's as much as 70% mood and 30% cognitive judgment. Is this clear so far? OK, I'm going to run with it. This is important. So at $70,000, increases in dollars don't change your mood. And at $120,000, roughly, uh, increases in getting richer doesn't change your judgment of, how, of the cognition of how good your life is. Uh, so that's the curvilinearity of it. Now, let me take you to right to the frontiers of the disputes on uh, wealth and well-being. These are important because they're tax and public policy related. And it's important to get, get straight what the data show. Now, uh, two clever friends of mine, just, Justin Wolfer and Betsy Stevenson, have said, ah, let's replot the life satisfaction uh, money data and look at, log, at life satisfaction and log income. Now, what that does is greatly uh, contract the money scale. And so an interval on a log scale from 10000 to $20,000 is the same interval as 100000 to 200000 That's basically what a log scale does. And indeed, when you replot it, it's a straight line. And they want to say, ah, that shows that income never satiates and that what we should do is just get more income. That clear? <laughs> OK, this, this is a conjuring trick. And the reason it's just a trick, and it's starting to, be, it's starting to influence public policy that says, hey, oh, forget this well-being stuff. What we all want is more money because of the log transformation. Uh, time, the log of time has no meaning in human life. That is, if, you wanna, if you've got a $100,000 income and you want to increase it to $200,000 to get as much kick as someone gets from increasing from ten to $20,000, you have to spend a huge amount more time. And time does not go on a log scale. So even if you haven't understood the arithmetic here, basically what this says is that if you're, if you're making $100,000, $80,000 would, would do, uh, and that's your annual income, and you're thinking about giving up four weekends next year to earn another $25,000, and what you care about is life satisfaction, the answer is clear. You shouldn't do it. And that's because spending those four weekends with family and friends will produce noticeably more life satisfaction than an extra $25,000. So the, the log wealth stuff should be ignored. Uh, and um, importantly, 
mood versus judgment should be taken seriously. And the question of if we're policymakers and we want to increase income, are we trying to put people in a better mood or are we trying to get them to judge their life as being better? And uh, this is really a, 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 a very complex call. If you're measuring happiness or well-being, do you want momentary happiness and you want to take the integral under the curve? So if I want to know how happy you are and I measure your life satisfaction every 10 minutes for a month, do I come up with how happy you were that month? And the answer turns out to be no. Because if I ask you at the end of the month, how was your month? It turns out you pay attention to things like the worst experience, the most recent experience, and not the integral. And so it turns out that when people uh, judge their experience cognitively, you get a very different answer from the measuring of moment-to-moment -moment mood. And public policy, I think, has to be based on judgment of your life and not mood. Uh, last thing I wanted to say is uh, this controversy I hear about all the time about inequality and taxi taxing rich people. And here's how the argument goes. You, is this an argument that you've heard about? Yeah. So uh, this is a complex literature, uh, and the answer is far from clear. And I, I'll take you through what I think the literature up to actually about two weeks ago shows. So first, what is the, what is the relationship across nations between how much inequality there is in income essentially the spread from the richest people to the poorest people, and life satisfaction. Okay, so first question clear? Okay, so um, there are a, a couple of dozen studies of this, and they've been, in fact, disappointing to the left. Uh, so it turns out that the single best study of this is a 100-nation study by Ruth Wienhoven, in which you essentially correlate discrepancy with Brazil is kind of at the top, United States is way up there and the like, with life satisfaction. And you ask, how much of the variance does the spread account for? And the answer worldwide is zero. zero. That is, if you take the entire world, there is essentially no effect of income inequality on life satisfaction by rank order of nations. But if you take just Europe, there is an effect. It's a small effect. Uh, by the way, you can see you can't take one nation here. The na you have to take the whole world or groups of nations to ask this question. Uh, so in Europe, there's a small effect of income inequality. Uh, in the rest of the world, there isn't. So that's uh, part one of these data. So then you ask the question, well, in the nations in which uh, income inequality and uh, well-being are related, what's going on? And the way a statistic, an epidemiologist asks this is to take things like corruption in government and partial that out and the like. And it turns out there are two things if you partial out, the effect disappears. And this is very important. So if you partial out how fair people believe income inequality is, the effect of income inequality vanishes. So in the United States, for example, uh, in which you've got considerable income inequality, uh, people by and large believe it's fair that they believe that somehow rich people have earned their money. I'm not, I'm not uh, endorsing this as I'm saying what people believe. So when a, na when a nation believes it's fair, the effect of income inequality on life satisfaction disappears. Uh, so in Brazil, where people believe it's not fair, there is a big effect uh, that is due to corruption and the like. In the United States, it disappears. Similarly, if people believe there is considerable upward mobility in a society, the effect of uh, income inequality disappears. So that's the state of the art about wealth and well-being. Uh, again, I, I, I send my apologies for being opinionated and not showing you graphs and figures. I'm giving you my overview of where the science is about this. Creativity and innovation, uh, changing topic completely. I, I think our future in many ways depends on our, our being drawn into the future, on our ability to innovate and create things that aren't 
there now. And I have four things to say about creativity that are new, brand new in the creativity literature. Uh, the first is that Newton, the story of Newton and the apple is real. I, I didn't know this until I uh, started to talk with Jim Glick, a historian of Newton. But it's not what you think it was. So when Newton was 22, one evening he was sitting at his desk during the plague, and he saw an apple, and it subtended the same angle as the moon which was behind it. So the moon was right in back of an apple. And Newton said, could, could it be that what draws the apple to the earth is the same thing that holds the moon in orbit? So in fact, the aha, the, the aha experience is in, indeed part and parcel of many creative acts. It's for real. That's part one. Part two is Newton had a lot of intellectual scaffolding that allowed him to see that none of us could have done it. I mean, Newton really was amazing. Uh, uh, and so what is the intellectual scaffolding? How do you build the intellectual scaffolding to a point that you actually can have a useful aha experience? Question clear? Okay, well, there are two warring schools of thought. Uh, about this, and they're both people who are in, very interested in the education of children. So one of them is, is Anders Ericsson from Florida State University. Anders is the person who gets people to memorize digits of pi. At, anyone have a good guess about ha what the maximal number of digits of pi that have been memorized by a human being are? Anyone know what that answer is? It, throw out some numbers. 3,000, yeah. yeah. It's 37,000. Uh, and um, sim so by the way, how many push ups, and Anders is interested in push ups. How many push ups do you think a human being can do at maximum? 40,000. And it only ended because he had to defecate. So um, Anders is interested in uh, how do you get to 36,000 digits of pi? And his answer is sweat. <laughs> Deliberate practice in which you're constantly right at the edge of what you know and you're spending all your time doing it. It took, uh, to do the 37,000 digits of pi took a, a, an entire year, 10 hours a day to do. Uh, um, um, so he, Anders says that we have to make our kids sweat in order to get high achievement. M my good friend Mike Csikszentmihalyi, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, Mike, Mike went to a school in Italy uh, in which over the lintel, is that what you call them? Yeah, it said the, the roots of learning are bitter, but the fruits are sweet. And that's the Anders Ericsson view of learning. Mike says that's immoral, and the only way you can build up the scaffolding is by making learning fun, by putting people into flow. And that's how you get it. So these two are at both moral and empirical war with each other about how to build uh, the scaffolding, and no one knows the answer to that. Uh, the third of four things that's new about uh, genius and innovation is it's very common to think, when you think of Michael, Michelangelo or Beethoven, that they were one in a million on composing music or sculpture. Well, there's a different view of genius. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit mathematical, but I think you'll get it. You can get one in a million at sculpture by being one in a million at sculpture. But there's another way of getting it. If you multiply being pretty good at three different things together, if you multiply together th being in the upper 5% of three normal distributions, uh, picking out limestone, uh, self-promotion, and chiseling, I'm just making it up, then you get one in a million. So you, when you multiply tails of distributions together. So the question about the building of genius on this view shifts from looking for that one kid who just composes music way out to asking what are the components 
of being a good composer. And just being pretty good at each of those components. If the same kid has three or four or five of them, then you, you get a Michelangelo in that view. Uh, so that's a really, that's a revolutionary thing going on. And finally, uh, uh, Marie Forgeard has, when, when we think about creativity, for the most part, we're thinking about uh, uh, selfishness and narcissism and all these negative emotions about creativity. Uh, Marie Forgeard is arguing that creativity, one of the main motivations is generosity, pro-social. And I think that's most intriguing. I think it's probably true. Positive health. Um, okay, shifting gears again. <clears throat> About three years ago, the largest medical foundation in America, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, came to me and said, we've read your stuff on mental health, and we like that you argue that mental health is something over and above the absence of mental illness. So PERMA is essentially the argument that mental health is a real thing and it's not just the absence of diabetes or, or of being crazy. It's a presence of a real thing. They asked, could we do the same thing for physical health? Is physical health just the absence of illness or is it a real thing? So uh, they gave us a couple of very large grants and I put together uh, committees of sort of the best cardiovascular epidemiologists and the like. And we began to ask the question, I'll just do the cardiovascular one, and uh, this is a question relevant to your age group here. So half of you are going to die a cardiovascular death. And so this is the question of what protects against a cardiovascular death. So uh, the first thing we did is there are uh, quite a few longitudinal studies of cardiovascular death, Framingham being the most famous one. But because they're kind of typical uh, physical health studies, they never ask about anything good. They ask, have you been divorced? Do you have high blood pressure? Uh, on and on, one trauma, one bad thing after another. And what we wanted to do was to hold the bad stuff constant and ask, are there health assets that protect you from cardiovascular disease, if you have, even if you have the risk factors. Uh, and there were three classes of health assets we were interested in. The first was subjective, things like optimism, hope, uh, vitality, good cheer. The second was uh, uh, biological. So there are biological health assets, uh, things like oxytocin and high heart rate variability, for those of you who know the biological literature. And then functional health assets, loving your job, having a good marriage, being able to, at age 70, climb two flights of stairs and not get out of breath. So we began to look through the existing longitudinal literature, which measured all the bad stuff. And they occasionally ask not only uh, 10 questions on are you depressed, but they might have one question like, are you happy? Or are you satisfied with your marriage? So what we did was to hold constant all the risk factors and ask, what is the effect uh, when you reanalyze this data for health assets? <clears throat> and the answer is the market effect, even in this very uh, poorly measured literature. Uh, and the effect, uh, I'll just do optimism. So there are about 20 studies uh, in which cardiovascular illness is the target. The uh, risk factors are all well measured and a little bit of the health assets are measured. So the Guilte study is a study in which uh, a thousand Dutch men and women at age 65 were measured on everything, uh, then followed for 10 years. Uh, uh, 350 of them die of cardiovascular things over the next 10 years. Uh, and they also measured optimism. So they're able to ask, what is the effect of being optimistic over and above every other risk factor on dying? So is the question clear? Yeah. Pretty important question. And the answer is it's massive. So basically, if you're in the bottom quartile of optimism, that's about equivalent to smoking two and a half packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, 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 
Optimistic people holding constant risk factors live markedly longer than pessimistic people. And there are about 15 studies that show that. And then there are three Japanese studies on M meaning. Anyone speak Japanese here? Okay, so I, I, you, no one will contradict me. I'm told ik, ik, ikigai in Japanese means having a reason to live. So these three studies measure the usual blood pressure, heart rate stuff, uh, and uh, they ask about some is it first instance of heart attack and one is recovery from stroke. And again, ikigai, having a reason to live, shows a big effect on uh, the prevention of heart attack and recovery of stroke over and above risk factors. Now, the reason that's important to us is there are these massive industries multi-billion dollar industries that change blood pressure and cholesterol and get, uh, I would say, small, and I mean small in a good technical sense that I'll refer to in a few minutes, uh, uh, effects on heart disease. Well, it turns out the skills of a good marriage and the skills of optimism are eminently trainable. And wouldn't it be interesting if this was causal and that by learning PERMA at this time of your life, you will do better than taking anti cosar and Lipitor and the like. So that's the question. Can we uh, 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 control our runaway health care expenditure by uh, immunization psychologically with well-being? Uh, and uh, if, for those of you who uh, read, Barbara Ehrenreich uh, wrote a uh, Barbara, uh, Barbara wrote an article called I Hate Hope. She's written a book on uh, uh, the ha I'm, I'm a, uh, the captain of the happiness police in Barbara's mind. She thinks I go around telling people, uh, you know, be happy or else. And she had a terrible experience uh, 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 when she got breast cancer. It was all these people told her to wear pink and be happy and all that. And she basically argues that uh, uh, forget this stuff about hope and optimism. Uh, there's no reason to believe in cancer that there is an effect. Well, a meta-analysis of the cancer literature has just come out, and it basically shows there is a small effect, a uh, positive effect overall, the whole literature on hope and outcomes and quality of life in cancer, uh, not nearly as big as the effect in heart disease. Uh, so that's the state of the, the cancer literature. I think Barbara basically uh, uh, took her one experience and declined, did not review the literature. Uh, so that's positive health. Uh, and uh, we are now doing this in the entire United States Army. So uh, I'm not going to have a chance to talk about the Army today, but we now have 1.1, the medical records going forward on 1.1 million soldiers. We have PERMA and all the other health assets on 1.1 million soldiers. So we, General Cornyn and I are the custodians of this data set. We'll be able to ask quite definitively uh, what is the effect of PERMA uh, on diabetes, heart disease, cancer, recovering from a wound, infection, and the like. Uh, so there is a, a, a new data set arising, which will actually be the authoritative data set about positive health. Um, okay, let's see where we are. Measurement. Uh, how shall we measure the happiness, the well-being of individuals or society? Now. Uh, Many of my colleagues, uh, uh, mostly economists, want there to be a simple measure like dollars. And my friend Richard Laird has argued the final common path of uh, well-being is life satisfaction. Well, the PERMA view is a dashboard view, and it's different. It says there is no one measure of well-being, and that if you think about uh, an airplane and piloting an airplane, there is a dashboard of instruments you pay attention to. Uh, the altitude, the RPMs, the fuel gauge, the, the wind speed, uh, speed through the air. And depending on your mission, some of the gauges are more important than others. Well, I believe that, that human well-being is even more complicated than, than uh, airplanes, and there is no one measure 
like how satisfied are you with your life. But depending on your mission, political or individual, there are different parts of PERMA that you want to pay attention to. So that, that's the forefront of the public policy and uh, medical arguments about how to measure well-being. And I, I strongly uh, believe in uh, the dashboard. Now, as I mentioned uh, uh, half an hour ago, uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, has uh, decided that he will measure the well-being of uh, England and uh, hold himself accountable for the success or failure of public policy by changes in well-being. And he's measuring it uh, someplace between what Richard Laird wants and what I want. So every three months, there, uh, the statist uh, there are 200,000 phone calls to a representative sample of Brits, which asks four questions. One, how satisfied are you with your life? How satisfied are you with your health care? Uh, were you anxious yesterday? And how much meaning? you have in life. So it's the beginning of a dashboard. And uh, he, uh, the Prime Minister claims he will hold himself accountable for public policy uh, by changes in well-being. And that, by the way, is very brave of him because, as you know, uh, he's engaged in draconian cuts in the economy. And I have every reason to think those would really affect well-being. But uh, he's moving from uh, using wealth criteria to using well-being criteria, and he has not stacked the deck in his favor. Uh, now, I think there may be a better way of doing this uh, methodologically that actually will re revolutionize uh, the way we uh, measure well-being. Uh, I believe we can measure the well-being of the world instantly and for free. Uh, and I'm devoting a lot of research to it now. And that's because of the social media. So um, I've been working with Google and Twitter and Facebook on the following. Uh, PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment, have a lexicon. So for positive emotion, happy, sad, there are about 80 positive emotion and negative emotion words in English. And it turns out there are about 2,000 PERMA and anti-PERMA words in English and 45,000 phrases. So we scan the Facebook, billions of words on Facebook, looking for changes in the PERMA lexicon. And so on this view, uh, so for example, when the Chilean miners were rescued a couple of years ago, if you scan Twitter and Facebook from Chile, uh, the, the P words, the positive emotion words, go up, but not in Argentina. So that essentially is the sort of thing we're looking at. So we believe this measure, uh, scanning, uh, instead of going up and, and phoning Matthew and saying, how satisfied are you with your life, Matthew, which I think is heir to just any number of methodological problems, what we hope we can do is if you, if, uh, uh, your prime minister decides, uh, or for if, if Jay Wetherill decides, he's going to uh, build a library, uh, a new library in the northern suburbs, that instead of asking people, how satisfied are you with the new library, you can merely scan for the engagement words and the meaning words for the northern suburbs before, during, and after, as you're uh, uh, finding to find out if it works. So uh, we're after... The, the reliable measurement of the well-being of the world uh, uh, in, instantly in time and place. Uh, and I'm going to skip that for now. Now, we're at a choice point. Uh, we only go to 10.30, and this is this scary stuff on medication, which I can easily skip and go on to my conclusion, which is about the outcome. So how many of you want me to skip medications? Oh, okay. <laughs> so we might not do much on outcomes. Uh, okay, a book you all have to read. Uh, it, it still keeps me up at four in the morning, called The Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. It was published two years ago, but it wasn't reviewed for a year and a half. And Whitaker does something very scary and very creative in the book. And I should kind of tell you what my posture about medications was before I read the book. So if you had come to me and said you have a uh, 
a 10-year-old kid with ADHD, I would have said try Ritalin. And very often when people come to me with depression, I say, well, try the antidepressives and try cognitive therapy. So I've spent a lot of my life testing medications and uh, uh, psychotherapies and asking what the outcomes are. Uh, and they're basically a tie. You know, they both l l do pretty well. Now here's what Whitaker does in his book. Uh, he's just a reporter, but uh, it's uh, the integrity of the data that he talks about is, is good, very good. Uh, and he thought of something that none of us had thought of. Um, first thing he points to is uh, disability claims in the United States since 1985 for mental illness. Uh, the budget for mental illness has increased fourfold in the United States over the last uh, uh, 30 years. The number of disability claims for mental illness has increased fourfold over that same period of time. Now imagine if we had devoted $40 billion to cardiovascular disease and it went up by fourfold during that period. Okay. For, and so that's part one. What in the world is going on here? There's much more of it, uh, at least by disability claims. The second thing he then points to is he reminded me when I was a young clinical psychologist of the things I never saw. So here's what I never saw 30 years ago doing clinical psychology. I never saw a bipolar child. I never saw a child with manic depression. Uh, I never saw a rapid cycling manic depression in adults. It was almost unknown. Uh, and when I dealt with schizophrenia, it was really nasty but it tended to burn out, and it wasn't really a lifelong condition. It had three, four, five episodes, but there was quite a bit of hope later in life. Now, uh, uh, up to 1% of children, maybe as many as 3% of children, have bipolar illness. Uh, rapid cycling, bipolar is common, and schizophrenia is lifelong. You, know, you never get rid of it. So. That's part two. Part three, Whitaker goes through the neuroscience of the antidepressants, the antibipolars, uh, uh, Ritalin and the like, and makes the claim that <clears throat> the body regards medications as toxins, as foreign invaders, and uh, forms long-term defenses against them. That's the way the body works. And the way the long-term defenses work, the, the medications have good short-term effects. But if you read, as I do, because I report on it all the time, uh, the medication literature, we typically only test the first six weeks in the medication literature. We very rarely go beyond six weeks. And in general, uh, Ritalin, uh, in that literature, the you know, kids calm down in school, uh, in the antidepressant literature, uh, uh, people become more active and less sad. In the bi in the ma with Mannix, uh, people become markedly less crazy on the uh, 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 the an anti manic depression drugs. Uh, and here's the jump. He says that the long term effects of all of these drugs is to create more mental illness. That the dr the defenses that are formed against these drugs by the brain create more mental illness. So he argues that the uh, increase, really the first time uh, occurrences of, of bipolar illness in 10-year-olds is a function of the long-term effects of the amphetamines, of the Ritalin-like drugs. That uh, rapid cycling bipolar is a reaction to the uh, uh, manic drugs that the increase in depression in the long run is a reaction to the antidepressants. Um, we don't know if this is true. <coughs> Since starting about 30 years ago, no one ever ran control groups anymore. So once we found that there were good six-week effects of the medications, we said, oh, well, that's what we should do in treatment. And so there are now literally no really good studies 
that are long and longitudinal, in which one group of schizophrenics gets uh, the, the anti-schizophrenic drugs, and another group gets nothing. And then you look at them over the long term. So no one's done it. So um, the takeaway from that is Australia is in a nicer position than the United States. So you're not owned by the drug companies. We are owned by Big Pharma. Big Pharma really is entrenched. But now you want to think very carefully about public policy and individual policy about uh, uh, the medications and mental illness. Again, I know I've offended some of you and the like, but indeed I'm very worried that we have done a great disservice. So let me whip quickly through outcomes and then we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So um, mostly what I do in life is measure the effects of, uh, of uh, the preventative well-being programs on depression, anxiety, and well-being. And there's now big literature on this. And the effect sizes are small. And that's important that you know that. Sm that there's a, a technical, small, moderate, and big effect uh, for in statistics. It comes out of the therapy literature. So a big effect uh, is that the, the experimental condition getting cognitive therapy does eight-tenths of a standard deviation better than the control group. A moderate effect is four-tenths. A small effect is two-tenths. Uh, these are all two-tenths of a standard deviation effects. And that's what we expected because you're doing prevention as opposed to treatment. So when you do prevention, a whole lot of people get it who don't need it. That is, you're doing universal prevention. When you do treatment, everyone needs it. Uh, so, but when you read this literature, you see these are only small effects. You should know what that means. Uh, uh, over this literature, uh, uh, 21 outcome studies in, of giving the Penn Resilience Program to children in school. Uh, depressive symptoms go down uh, uh, over the next uh, couple of years. Anxiety symptoms go down, and uh, conduct, uh, si conduct gets better. Uh, there are uh, now a fair number of uh, web studies, and there's about to be, the BBC is about to launch a huge one in which uh, mem members of the general public go to my website, authentichappiness.org, and they see a link that says exercises. You either get one exercise, like a gratitude visit, or a placebo, like writing down uh, uh, childhood memories. And what you find uh, in these web studies is, by and large, that single exercises, uh, uh, there are about a dozen of them now, have six-month-long effects on life satisfaction and depression relevant to placebo. <clears throat> there's an interesting literature for those. How many of you are therapists? So there's an interesting literature arising about what order to present. Uh, so one of the problems about the therapy literature, you just get this package to do, like cognitive therapy. We're doing it from the ground up, in which we're doing every single exercise. And now people are asking, what's the best order? Uh, given what you know about the patient, to present uh, uh, components of therapy in. Uh, there are uh, a couple of meta-analyses of the positive intervention literature. Uh, they basically show that the uh, Penn Resilience Program with children uh, is uh, uh, the best documented uh, uh, preventer of depression and anxiety of children we know, and that overall positive interventions are effective uh, beyond placebo and beyond our usual uh, interventions in clinical psychology. And uh, the granddaddy of all of this is our 1.1 million soldiers. So uh, every uh, month now, 180 drill sergeants come to the University of Pennsylvania. We train them in positive psychology and resilience. They're training the entire Army. The Army is measuring anxiety, depression, suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, and psychological effects in the 1.1 million soldiers. And they're evaluating this very closely. They published their first three studies of this, which show uh, good effects of this. And in June, they will publish the data on post-traumatic stress disorder and suicide. OK. Good week. So let me summarize what I've tried to do today, if it's summarizable. Uh, 
I basically said that uh, uh, there is something new in psychology, that the basic premises of psychology have been medical, that it should be about treating diseases. And I've said, let's keep doing that, but in addition, let's build well-being. And the building of well-being is not armchair. It actually comes from a, a, a burgeoning science of well-being in which people are looking at things like wealth and well-being, uh, uh, what is the, how does well-being develop over time, what is the neuroscience of well-being, and uh, what are the systematic effects of treatment in well-being. And so I've argued that in addition to treating what's wrong, we need to identify and build what's right, and that indeed is the hope for the future of psychology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, that's a pretty broad bed of concepts and ideas to underpin the rest of the day. And uh, I hope that you will continue to refer to some of these concepts or queries that Martin's offered us this morning throughout the rest of the day. But we've got time really for two or maximum three questions only. Uh, your voice is just about no, running out. No, my voice is fine. Can, I, can we start over here, please? If we have, we'll take a microphone to you. Please introduce yourself. And please uh, bear in mind we don't have much time, so I'm afraid it won't be a very le lengthy okay. session. Just wanted to ask a sort of two-part question. Um, in studying the science of well-being, are you also considering the effects of spirituality from, say, things like a simple meditation, affirmations, spiritual groups that are outside orthodox uh, yeah. orthodox? Yes. Churches? So the M in PERMA about meaning is uh, the questions of f from where do human beings derive meaning and purpose in life. And one of the major subsets is spirituality. So we're very interested in things like the meditation techniques, transcendence, having meaning in life. And I'll just give you one teasing hint about uh, the data that are emerging. So I mentioned that uh, in the Army, uh, uh, we're quite interested in the relationship of well-being to suicide. Okay, so we have measured... The field of suicide is a hopeless mess, and the reason it's a hopeless mess is no one ever had a large number of suicides, all of whom took the same test. Well, last year, uh, uh, there were 80, we had 84 suicides in the Army uh, and 800,000 men and women who didn't kill themselves, all of whom took my tests. So we were able to ask, can you predict it? And the answer is yes. And it uh, the hallmark predictors are if you're in the bottom 1% on meaning and purpose in life and spirituality. Uh, my life in the army has no meaning, my work in the army has no meaning, then you're at high risk for suicide. So we're very interested in spirituality. And this is probably just a quick yes or no, uh, but I think it's important. Um, the science of well-being is, it seems to be very much in the psychology field. Is psychiatry getting involved in this? And that's all I needed to know. Yeah, there, there, there are in, indeed uh, small psychiatric involvement. So um, a few years ago, George Valiant and I and Rick Summers, our, uh, two of my psychoanalyst friends, gave a course on positive psychoanalysis in which, and when the substance of that was, we typically stop analytic therapy when we think there's good resolution of conflict. But this was the argument, once you've got that, you then want to add the skills of PERMA on top. So this is a question of when you would terminate psychiatrically. Thank so you very much. Thank you very much. There's some, thank you so much for being here. There's some really disturbing work that's come from um, Harvard University that shows that medical students, when they come into medical school, have higher altruism values on psychometric testing than the n normal population, which is kind of cool. But it only takes one year in a tertiary hospital. We can beat that out of you. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I'm interested in whether there might be a link between well-being and altruism and would like yep. to hear your opinion. Uh, the same thing is true of law school as well, that lawyers in, are very idealistic before they show up. And then in their first year in the United States, uh, everything changes. 
and it becomes the kind of profession that is now caricatured. So both medical schools have been, and law schools have been asking us, can there be well-being courses in medical and law school, and what would that, the effect be on keeping the idealism of young doctors and young lawyers? So and in fact, there are, my students have been designing such courses, and the medical one is almost ready. So if there is a medical school in Australia that wants to take a chance on a first-year well-being course, I can probably provide a, a professor in a curriculum. Uh, just with reference to your comments on the medication in the book yeah. written by Mr. Whittaker, I can see the benefits and the harm caused by medications. Uh, but you also mentioned that in the last 30 years there's a speculation that perhaps the medications could have caused um, some of the other conditions to come which did not exist in the past. I wondered, uh, there are a number of other confounding variables, a couple of the most important ones are with respect to the drug use. I guess Australian society is a bit more tolerant and ex experimental, so there are larger proportions of people who uh, experiment on drugs. and. Uh, the potency of some of the drugs like marijuana has certainly increased because of uh, the different methods of growing marijuana, example, the hydroponic ways of doing it. The second thing is that um, human beings have gone through a significant cultural change from being uh, hunters to farmers to now living in this concrete jungle. Uh, what is the contribution of uh, the significant hygiene that is practiced? For example, um, allergies is much often seen in society like, uh, like in Australia where there's a significant uh, emphasis on hygiene. Just your comment on these two, thank you. Um, yeah. Um the, uh, and I'll mention the fourth confound. So what's wrong with Whitaker's argument, uh, which I didn't mention, is part of, part, all of his literature comes from, uh, a lot of it comes from looking at people who've had drugs and then looking at their probability later in life of more schizophrenia or bipolar uh, versus people who have escaped the drugs but have roughly the same illness. But the problem is there's a severity confound, that the people who have drugs by and large are more severe than the people who don't. So you can't tell without the right random assignment match study, uh, placebo controlled, whether or not the added mental illness of the people who have drugs is a function of the drugs or of the increased severity. Okay. I thank the chairs in anticipation, but now I'd ask you to thank Martin Seligman for his uh, work this morning.